Hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, I'm beginning a new character study today. And this is a character that is not so obvious in the scriptures. And the, the term, the angel of the Lord, and what is known as Theophanies or Christophanies. And if you're not familiar with all this terminology, that's uh, what I'm going to do is explain what all that means. We'll look at all the verses that um, we may have these uh, theophanies or Christophanies. Uh, all right. So let me begin uh, first by I've got a few notes here uh, because this is a subject that I'm not. Um, I haven't really studied exhaustively before. I'm familiar basically with the concepts. But today, I'll not only be teaching you, but I'll also be learning as I go here. So, first question is, who is the angel of the Lord? If you see this term, the angel of the Lord in the scriptures, what does that mean? Uh, here's here's uh, some notes I have. The precise identity of, uh, quote, angel of the Lord is not given in the Bible. How, however, there are many important clues to his identity. There are Old and New Testament references to, quote, angels of the Lord, unquote. Quote, an angel of the Lord, unquote. And the angel of the Lord, unquote. It seems when the definite article, the, is used. It is specifying a unique being, separate from the other angels. The angel of the Lord speaks as God, identifies himself with God, and exercises the responsibilities of God. Uh, there's a few verses I'm going to look at. First, finish this point here. In several of these appearances, those who saw the angel of the Lord feared for their lives because they had seen, quote, seen the Lord, unquote. Therefore, it is clear that in at least some instances, the angel of the Lord is a theophany, an appearance of God in physical form. <laughs> uh, if you're not familiar with this in the scriptures, uh, this may be a big surprise to you. The God has actually appeared in physical form throughout the scriptures. Now, we know that uh, when Jesus was born, that was God manifest in the flesh. God became a man and appeared to the world as a, as a man and the son of God. Uh, but these are other cases. This is not talking about the incar incarnation of Jesus for 33 years. So... Uh, if you weren't aware of that, this may be a big surprise to you. Let me look at a few of these verses here to uh, see what we can learn here. Uh, Genesis, let's look at Genesis 16, 7 through 12. See what we can find there. All right. It says, and the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way of Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence camest thou, and whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress and submit thyself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child and shalt bear a son, and shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man, his hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. 
Well, the thing that really stands out here is the, uh, in this word here, it says in verse 10, it says, and the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly. So uh, here this person uh, identified as the angel of the Lord says, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly. It seems to me that that's the part of this verse that gives this, the angel of the Lord, the power of God. I mean, obviously, an ordinary angel I cannot multiply thy seed exceedingly. Angels, seraphim, cherubim, and anything else that God identified as an angel never has this, this kind of a power. Only God has that kind of a power. So that's why, in this case, it seems that the, the angel of the Lord must be God. God appeared to her. Uh, so look at the beginning. It was, and the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the way in the sh way to Shur. And he said, to Hagar, Sarah's mine. Now, I don't see anything in this section of verses uh, that uh, Sarah is. Yes, someone there? Oh, hi. Hi, Brother Sam. Hey, Brother Luke. Oh. Hey. You got a, you got some free time today? I thought you might be tied up with your family. Oh well, you know I am uh, free. I got to free up time for you, I guess. <laughs> Fantastic! I'm I'm happy you're here with me. Uh, did you hear anything I've said so far? Oh no, I just clicked the link though. Okay, all right. Well, um, the study today is the term the angel of the Lord, and the terms theophany and Christophany. Uh, you, Brother Bill, and I discussed this briefly in a previous study, and we decided that at some future time we would get into the subject more deeply, and today's the day. <laughs> so, Sounds the, good. Yeah. The, the first, uh, first thing I want you to know that um, it seems that um, um, is an important premise is that we see the term, um, let me see, how is it phrased again? Um, the terms angel of the Lord, no, I'm sorry, um, angels of the Lord, we see the term an angel of the Lord, and then we see the term the angel of the Lord. But it seems that there's a distinction when, we, when this uh, article the is at the beginning, when it says the angel of the Lord, in those cases, uh, many people believe that this uh, makes this different than the other appearances of angels. This is the angel of the Lord, and they believe that these are cases of theophanies, where God has appeared in physical form. Uh, this is before the incarnation of Jesus. We know that God appeared in physical form as the Son of God uh, at the incarnation of Jesus. But these cases appear are, are before, throughout the scriptures, we see this happening numerous times that we'll look at. So one thing that is important to understand is the term the angel of the Lord is different than um, an angel of the Lord or angels of the Lord. Let me get your response to that before I review the verses that I, I just went over. Yeah, I, I would agree. Uh, of course, we have to review the, uh, uh, the passages in full context. But uh, yeah, sure. Uh, this study sounds very interesting. Yes. Okay, it looks like Brother Bill is with us now, too. So, uh, Bill, hi. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. I was a little bit delayed, but yeah, I got here in the end. Okay, good. Um, I thought I was going to have to try to teach this by myself, and then everybody would be uh, very uh, kind of shortchanged because they'd only get my opinion of all this. So I'm glad you guys are here to to give me your uh, viewpoints and all this, but. Um, did you, how much have you heard so far, Bill? Anything at all? I just, all I, did, I come in and I heard Sam say, yeah, I agree with that. Okay. So, not a lot, not a lot. Let me, let me repeat this for the third time, because this is, this is the foundational idea of the whole study. Oh. And that is that there is a distinction when we see in the scriptures the term uh, angels of the Lord or an angel of the Lord 
And finally, the angel of the Lord. It seems that when we see the article the at the beginning, this is totally different than just angels appearing. The angel of the Lord, it seems, is we're going to see today that uh, at least many people believe that when it says the angel of the Lord, this is a theophany or a Christophany. We'll define those terms a little bit later, but, but uh, an appearance of God in physical form before the incarnation of Jesus. So uh, that's the first point, is that we're looking at the term the angel of the Lord, and we want to determine if this is uh, unique, unique uh, as compared to the other appearances of angels. Okay, so let me get your reaction to that, Bill, before I review the verse I already read. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's correct. Yeah, you know, that's all the what I've always believed that you know when it's the angel of the Lord, you know, I generally believe, especially if the context backs up, that, that it's speaking of, of a Christophan. Yes. So, yeah. Okay, uh, now I've got a lot of verses we're going to be looking at here, but the first thing uh, we, we looked at here is uh, the, uh, um, let me see, I've got uh, Genesis 16, verses 7 through 12. And while you're getting that, do you have your, uh, 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 Brother Sam, Like can, you can put this up on the screen if that's, you know, you've done that in the past, if you want to put it up, go ahead. Uh, but get that in front of you. Okay, good. Okay. Um, now the uh, the important thing in this verse, as I as I see it, is um, it says, "And the angel of the Lord." So first of all, we see that this this uh, unique term, "the angel of the Lord," is is what we're talking about here. And it says, found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way of Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence camest thou, and whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, return to thy mistress and submit thyself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. But the uh, there is one phrase in there that I talked about before you guys joined me that I think is the kind of the um, indication that this angel of the Lord is not merely just an angel messenger. Uh, can you, uh, before I... Uh, I've already given my opinion. Can you pull out any phrase in those verses there, one phrase that supports that? What was, um, okay, what, uh, what is the question? I'm sorry if you can repeat that. Okay, uh, I read verses 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. And uh, there is one phrase, one statement in, in the, among those verses here that seems to make uh, me believe that the angel of the Lord is God himself, not merely a, an angel messenger. Uh, does any, ver any part of that, uh, those verses stand out to you that, that supports that? I'm gonna... yeah. Verse 10. Yeah, I was going to say verse 10. Because you know, it says, the angel of the Lord said, I will multiply those seed exceedingly. And that was a similar promise that God Himself gave to Abraham in regard to Isaac, and then eventually Christ. You know, a normal angel hasn't got the, you know, that that power in them. You know, that they, they give a message, but this says, you know, the angel of the Lord said unto her, you know, I will multiply thy seed. Not God will multiply your seed. It is I, and, and I believe, yeah, that that certainly is a theophany of, of some description. Uh huh. Yeah. So that's the ver that's the part that stood out to me, and I'm uh, for the same reason. How, how can an ordinary angel uh, claim that kind of a, an ability? And it's not like he's saying God said this. He's he's saying I will. So uh, that to me makes is convincing, brother Sam. Yes, I, I would agree. Okay. Um, all right. Now the the next thing we look at is. Um, let me see. Uh, let's look at Genesis 21, 17 through 
17 and 18. I haven't looked at this yet either, so, okay. It says, and God heard the voice of the lad, and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven, and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him in thine hand, for I will make him a great nation. Now again, there is something there that just strikes me as I read it. And what it does see if you got the same reaction I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, the same, the same point. And again, what it is says, "Oh, you know." Yeah, it says, "For I will make him a great nation." That's that's what God said He would do. So this this uh, person that is identified as the angel of God which would be the same as the angel of the Lord, and, and uh, is, is saying, that saying I will make him a great nation. That's what God promised. So, again, these are the reasons that people think that the term angel of God, angel of the Lord, is God himself appearing. Uh, right, and verse 16, uh, right after verse 15, uh, and the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time, and said, By myself have I sworn, said the Lord, because, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son. So here, you know, he's he referring himself as the Lord, uh, saying, By myself have I sworn, said the Lord. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, there's uh, very good. I didn't look at the and go back and get more context, but it just reinforces this idea. Now we have other verses uh, in Genesis and Exodus, Judges, and Samuel and Zechariah here that I have listed, but I don't want to go make that same point uh, over and over again yet. Because uh, let me move on here to the, it says in several of these appearances, those who saw the angel of the Lord feared for their lives because they had seen the Lord. Therefore. It is clear that in at least some instances, the angel Lord is a theophany, an appearance of God in physical form. Um, well, let's let's look at one in Exodus and see what that one says. Exodus three two. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see anything where they're afraid, uh, as it said in the notes there. Uh, maybe if we look at it more, in more context, do you have the verses around it? Genesis 3. Let's just see. Genesis 3. Exodus 3, you Exodus 3. Exodus 3 in full chapter here is the full chapter. Okay. And uh, verse 2 is the one that uh, we're talking about. And further in verse 4 mentions uh, the Lord. Uh, in verse 4, and when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here I am. So again, he's, uh, you know, we can see the angel of the Lord being equating, being equated to the Lord and God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, uh, yeah, this whole this whole chapter here, um, not all of it, but it, it goes into more detail in this this occurrence. Uh, but let's look at another because we have a lot of verses to go through here. Uh, uh, let's look at Judges 21, 1 through 4. Okay. Uh, and an angel of the Lord came upon 
up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I made you go up out of Egypt and have brought you into the land which I swear unto, which I swear unto your fathers. Now here, this is uh, interesting because here we have the term an angel of the Lord, but he's speaking to speaking in a way he says, I made you go up and uh, and that brought you out of land which I swear unto your fathers. That's that's what God promised. So again, we see this term angel of the Lord, but but the uh, it's not preceded with the and his and. And also we can see the similar thing going on in Judges thirteen twenty one, where it says, "But the angel of the Lord did no did no more appear to Mona and his wife than Mona." knew that he was an angel of the Lord. So we can see that uh, when, when it's used in terms of like a third person as, as if uh, in, in, a, in a place, as if the Mona is saying, uh, in, he would be referring the angel of the Lord as an angel of the Lord. Yeah. So in this context, they're the same. Yeah, and in verse 4 of Judges 2, 1 through 4, verse 4 it says, And it came to pass when the angel of the Lord spake these words. So, uh, yeah, it's this is another example of, of the angel of the Lord uh, I say, speaking in a way that we can only conclude this is God speaking. Brother Bill? Well, yeah, yeah, it's fun because it's always... The context is there as well, isn't it? You know, it, it is actually there. Always in reference to I or God or, or again I am, we will. It, it's it's all there. So yeah, I'm in agreement so far. Okay, uh, there's some more examples we can give here, but uh, I want to go into more uh, uh, more clear cases of this the Theophany Christophany situation, but. Uh, uh, here's a point that um, I don't know if this will surprise you, but uh, I, I can't think of any case. But this writer that I'm referring to, his notes here, it says, The appearances of the angel of the Lord cease after the incarnation of Christ. Angels are mentioned numerous times in the New Testament, but, quote, the angel of the Lord, unquote, is never mentioned in the New Testament after the birth of Christ. It is possible that appearances of the angel of the Lord were manifestations of Jesus before his incarnation. Jesus declared himself to be the existent, quote, before Abraham, unquote, in John 8, 58. So it is logical that he would be active and manifest in the world. Whatever the case, whether the angel of the Lord was a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ, which would be called a Christophany, or an appearance of God the Father, which is known as a theophany, it is highly likely that the phrase, the angel of the Lord, usually identifies as a physical appearance of God. Now, we're going to look at uh, more, uh, many more cases of this, but first we're just trying to establish this whole idea, the term the angel of the Lord, and the fact that God has appeared before Jesus was manifest in the flesh, God had also manifest himself many times throughout history in the scriptures, uh, in the flesh. Uh, and so we'll look at a lot more examples. But before we go on, what's your response to that? Well, I, a little problem I have with that is uh, I'm looking at Matthew 28, 2. It says, And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and set upon it. So, you know, that, it, as far as the angel of the Lord is concerned, whenever I see these sort of uh, passages, uh, we must understand that God is quite omnipotent, and omniscient, omnipresent. So, you know, I mean, uh, the angel of the Lord is not really necessarily uh, restricted in just one sense, uh, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, I'd agree with that, you know, and that's why, you know, and I hope people don't shoot me down again and call me a heretic, what, what I brought up the, the tree of me a few weeks ago, that, that, that I believe that one time in history, 
you know, all three, three persons of the Trinity appeared to, to Abraham. But yeah, God is omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient. You know, he can be wherever he wants and you know, do whatever he wants. All right. When, when, um, so we, we've established that there's a concept called a theophany, which is uh, uh, an appearance of God the Father, uh, and then there's a Christophany, which is an appearance of Christ. Uh, and now, now Bill introduced the idea a few weeks ago of a, a triof, a, a triophany, is, it, is that what you called it, triophany? Yeah, a triophany, yep. A triophany, and uh, you gave the appearance of, an uh, you know, example of when, the angels um, appeared to Abraham, and two of them went off and destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, and one remained behind. Uh, and that uh, uh, many people think that the one that remained behind was the angel of the Lord, who was Jesus, uh, Christophany. But you're you're believing that the three of them represented were actually uh, a triophany, uh, an appearance of the whole Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all at the same time. Uh, I can think of two other examples, but but not as good as the one that you have here with Abraham, because they appeared as people with bodies walking, and, and with uh, uh, whereas the examples I'm going to give you are are, are not uh, I don't think they're bodily, but you've got the baptism of Jesus at the same time you have Jesus, and then you have the Holy Spirit ascending in the manner of a dove, and you had the Father speaking, this is my beloved Son. So this is an example of the, the whole Godhead, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, uh, all at one place at one time, which to me defeats the whole argument of modalism or oneness. Um, another example is the uh, transfiguration, where you have Jesus, and people think that he's with uh, Moses, and it's Moses and Elijah, it says in the scriptures. But you also have the Father speaking, uh, listen to my son, and when Peter wanted to make an altar or something, and, and, and the voice comes from uh, God saying, this is my son, listen to him. And uh, so that's in a case where you have the Father and the Son, but I don't see the Holy Spirit in that one. Uh, so these could be tr triophanies, I guess, or what do you think? Well, yeah, I suppose that, that in one sense, yeah, yeah. If, if we're not just sticking to physical in body, you know, bodily manifestations, then yeah, of course, it could be a tree for me. Okay, but then also the uh, the angel of the Lord is quite uh, interdimensional as well. Uh, if we also uh, read Matthew's uh, here uh, first chapter and. Verse 20 and, and on, uh, here it says, the, uh, Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, meaning Joseph, in a, in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee, marry thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So uh, the angel of the Lord is quite um, boundless, limitless, and almost dimensionless. Uh, sometimes uh, he can transform into some sort of physical being, or he can also appear uh, in dreams or even visions, uh, basically to give the message uh, from God, uh, directly from God. Uh, so um, I think it's very flexible uh, being, and and just. It's just to show you how uh, what sort of method God is willing to use uh, to uh, give us revelations and 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 communicate in certain ways. Yeah, so I, I think that uh, your point here kind of uh, dis disputes the the point that this writer made that I, I cited earlier when he said the appearances of the angel of the Lord cease after the incarnation of Christ. Angels are mentioned numerous times in the New Testament, but, quote, the angel of the Lord is never mentioned in the New Testament after the birth of Christ. Oh, okay, well, that was before. Your your examples were before, weren't they? No, I gave um, also example from uh, after, when he was even buried, like in Matthew 28. Oh, yes, yes. 
Yes. So the, right. the, uh, the author either didn't know about uh, Matthew 28, uh, or he is restricting. It's, I'm not saying what he's saying is wrong, but he, I think he has restricted the, uh, the capacity and power uh, of the angel of the Lord. Yeah. Or well, he could have been even mentioned in between time because he, uh, you know, th this was the resurrection, wasn't it? In Matthew 28. Is that, is that what you wanted? So it was, like I said, it would have been better if the writer clarified, you know, while he was physically on earth. In, you know, I don't know, but, you know, this was the resurrection, wasn't it? <laughs> well, here uh, uh, I have another note from another author, and, and he says, uh, uh, according to McClintock and Strong, now I'm familiar with Strong's concordance, I'm not that familiar with McClintock, uh, it says, quote, God reveals himself only in Christ. Uh, the theophany is therefore more accurately defined as a Christophany or an epiphany of God in Christ, and all nature is a storehouse of signs of the divine presence, which uniformly point to Christ. Uh, so Strong and McClintock seem to think all of these cases would be Christophanies rather than a theophany, and I don't know what he's basing that on, but uh, I know that both of these terms are commonly used among theologians, so I don't think there's a, like some kind of universal agreement on that. Now, I'm not really interested in their terminology, and, uh, but, uh, of course, the, the best thing for us to do is just go straight to the Scripture and, uh, and see what the, uh, what the angel of the Lord does and what sort of message uh, he gives uh, and why and how. So from there, we can, we can see in context uh, that whether the, uh, that's merely a messenger like an angel, or uh, whether that's of God uh, or directly manifested uh, in any sort of form. Uh, so, okay. So let's let's now look at these these examples. And uh, the first one let's look at is Genesis twelve uh, seven through nine. Okay. Uh, it says, and the angel, and the Lord appeared unto Abram, and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there built he an altar unto the Lord, who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and high on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord, and called and called upon the name of the Lord. Um, um, and Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. Now, now we're not limiting ourselves to the term the angel of the Lord. We just, I just wanted to first establish that when we see the term the angel of the Lord, uh, uh, it probably would be our instinct to not think of it as God, but think of it as, as, as an angel, a messenger from God. But we've already shown that uh, some of these things that the angel of the Lord has said uh, prove that it has to be God. And yet he has this title, the angel of the Lord, for some reason. But in this case, it doesn't use the term angel of the Lord, but we do see uh, theophany or Christophany, whatever it is, because the Lord appeared to Abram. And he said, now it doesn't say here uh, anything about a physical manifestation. But it does say he appeared. What can we uh, conclude? Uh, do you think we can read any more into it than he, when it says he appeared, uh, appeared is a visual, isn't it? Right. Um, it, when, when the Lord appeared, um, he appears in many different forms, in many different ways. Um, yeah, some by visions and some by uh, actual phys physical manifestation, manifestation, I think. Uh, <clears throat> when Abraham was encountered, and also later on, we can see the uh, the three men coming to uh, coming to Abraham and and, and Sarah laughing 
uh, at those uh, at that time <laughs> for what they gotta say. So in that case, when you have visions, so to say, that you that's your own personal experience. Whereas uh, when you when when there's more than one person uh, can see them, uh, that's that might be a little different form of manifestation. Hmm. So, Brother Bill, what do you think? Do you think that when it says in that verse, uh, he appeared, uh, can we conclude that it was a visual appearance at least, uh, if not physical, but visual? Oh, yeah, yeah, because he appeared. So you'd have to see an appearance, so you'd have to see. You know, I personally believe it was a literal physical appearance. But, yeah, you know, as even Sam said, you know, you can have a vision and, you know, it could appear in front of you. But it's just the way, you know, it's it's rolled out and formed. It would lead me to believe that it was actually a physical appearance. Yeah. Now, I can't, uh, in my notes here, for some reason, uh, nobody cited, uh, to me, what is an obvious theophany. Uh and I was, it surprised me that I didn't find it in any of these uh, theologian studies. But uh, to, to me, the first example of a theophany is uh, Adam and Eve in the garden when God walked with them. Uh, do you know exactly where the verse is that says God walked with them in the garden? I, I couldn't find that from that. Around like chapter 2 or 3, probably very beginning. Chapter 3. Okay. He's taking, a, he's taking a stroll. He's taking a walk and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me see. What verse does it say? The Lord God called him to him. Uh, like in verse 8. Um, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I'm not sure why, uh, as I researched this a little bit to prepare, uh, I didn't see anybody reference that. Is there something different about this that, that uh, would, would disqualify it? And to me, it's it's the most obvious there is. All right. Yeah. Go ahead, Rosalind. Yeah, I was just gonna. I was just gonna say, yeah, that's. I don't know why, unless unless it is obviously so blatantly obvious that they thought it needn't have been you know expounded on because you can't get clearer than. <laughs> you know, God walking in the garden. You know, you can't get it clear on that, can you? Right. Mm -hmm. Also, just like uh, what we are discussing, and this is actual physical manifestation uh, because we can see Him, uh, the Lord, interacting with Adam, Eve, and the serpent. He's having actually conversation, and uh, and why have you done this? Why have you done that? Uh, you know, they're making excuses and blames, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, obviously, that's the physical manifestation of the Lord God. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Genesis 17, 1 through 4. Did we do that already? I, uh, Abram, it, when Abram was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me, and be thou perfect, and I will make a covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, uh, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Now, again, it says the Lord appeared to Abram. And to me, there's a difference between a, appearing and just uh, you know speaking, uh, or even a vision. Uh, you know, if it, it did say in the case you cited earlier, Sam, about the the, the angel uh, talking to uh, Mary, 
I think it was, and and uh, that was no to Joseph in a, somebody in a dream. Right. Who, who was it? He spoke to in a dream. Joseph. He spoke to Joseph in a dream. Yeah. The angel of the Lord spoke to spoke to Joseph in a dream. Yeah. So speaking to him in a dream, uh, you know, it, it it clarified that was a dream. But to me, if this was a dream or a vision, it seems to me it would have told us it's a vision. But it says, no, the Lord appeared to Abram. So here, in this case, it seems to me that this would qualify as a theophany. God uh, appearing uh, to Abraham. Mm -hmm. uh, now let's look at, uh, uh, let me see, uh, well, 15. Well, that's... Uh, uh, verses 9 and 10, verses 15 and 16, verses 22. It's all the same same case here. Let's go to Genesis uh, 18. Genesis 18, 1 through 3. Yeah, this is when, um, when, um, and when the Lord appeared to Abraham to give the me give him the message again. Did I? About, I'm about, sorry. I'm sorry. I put in the wrong thing here. Uh, that's Genesis 18, 1 through three. Right. I put in the wrong thing. Let me put it up there so I can read it along with you here. Well, I'll just put it in the chat bar anyway. <laughs> and also in the. Uh, on my on my share screen, you you okay. able to see it. Okay, go ahead, Sam. What were you saying? Oh, it's the same the same case. You know, the Lord appeared uh, in this case with with two other men. Uh, um, but I think they're all uh, transformed in a way, or manifest ma or manifested in the physical being, so they they can actually communicate with. Uh, with Abraham, even had, even to the point having having some yummy 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 dinner, and uh, and and even talking about like how uh, Sarah will be having uh, a kid <laughs> at her really old age, and even to the point that she would be laughing at the at the covenant. Uh, so they obviously uh, communicated. Each other. It's not like a one-way dream thing that you can only experience, but this is more or less that you can. When 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 the Lord has a, a specific intention and purpose to communicate with more than one person, I think uh, he appears in a physical form. Whereas in Joseph's uh, uh, dream. Uh, when he is to share something secretive and that only belongs to that particular person, I think he does so uh, in, in, a, in a dream. So depending on what kind of message, depending on to whom the message is given, I think the, uh, the, the magnification uh, can differ, but we can see that the message is basically of God and is God, so I think I think that way we can understand uh, this uh, this a little more. What this what the what is the message, uh, and how is the message given to whom, and when? And when we consider those things, I think we can understand this better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When we look at verse ten, Genesis eighteen ten, it says, "And he said, I will certainly return unto thee." I mean, obviously. If you're returning, that means you're you were there. You leave, and then you return again. It's it's an actual appearance of, and you are existing. You don't just, uh, you know, I will. It doesn't say I will just speak to you or I will give you another dream. So, these to me are all uh, make it obvious that this, right. God is actually appearing to right. me. And also, uh, if you look at the verse ten. Uh, 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 later part, and Sarah heard it in the tent door. So he's she's not really present in that room, so she's basically kind of overhearing it uh, behind the tent, and uh, she's laughing. So, <laughs> so you know we can see that this is not some sort of vision 
or just one-way uh, communication, but rather it's a physical manifestation where they actually having this conversation. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I want to move on to Genesis uh, 32, but uh, Bill, do you have anything to say before we move on? Yeah, just agreeing what people said, you know, and that's that's why, you know, little, little hints that you know they it's just funny that that God is triune and then three men appeared, and, and they're all in agreement because in verse 10, what's interesting, you know, uh, before 10 even, in verse said. It says in verse 9, And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. So it was in one accord, all three of these men, which I believe was the three, all said at the, time, at the same time, Where is Sarah? Just that, you know, it, little things like that I find interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you got Genesis 32, verses 24 through 30 there. It says, uh, And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. <laughs> and he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, uh, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. All right, let me get your reaction to that whole section here. Yeah, pretty obvious there. A couple of interesting points there. It is, you know, even, you know, it's amazing how anyone can even think this this isn't, you know, a theophany of some sort. You know, and Jacob called the name of the place Benal, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Yeah. So this was clearly God. And before that, you know, when they were wrestling, you know, he said, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. All right. He was blessed. Well, who's got power to bless people? Certainly an angel hasn't got power to bless anyone. Only God can bless them in that sense. So, you know, a few little key words in those passages proved to me that was definitely God. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that it's, it's uh, conclusive. That it is God. I mean, that's what it says in verse thirty. At least Jacob is is stating that it's God. Now, could Jacob be wrong? Um, it's like the point that uh, uh, Sam brought up when we were talking about um, the the fiery furnace, uh, and it was uh, who was the who was the king uh, that said, "I see the uh, the person there. It looks like the son of God. Who was it?" Uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. So uh, you brought up a very good point, Sam, that people think that uh, that's uh, uh, identified as the Son of God, but Nebuchadnezzar said it looks like the Son of God. And are, are we to believe that that is thus saith the Lord, or is that or is that what Nebuchadnezzar w was uh, his opinion? And here is another thing. This is in verse 30. Jacob is stating it. Are we to say that this is uh, thus saith the Lord? Or Jacob believed that he saw God face to face. Uh, I, I, I think that it's a fact. But what do you think about that? Well, for me, I think that the uh, um, is it, in this Jacob's case, he he, he was al he was alone. There was no people around him. There was nobody. Uh, so we could we could see this as, as a vision as well. Uh, whether he wrestled uh, the Lord uh, physically or not, I think uh, that's I think that's a little that's a little uh, irrelevant to to our discussion. But I, since it is written as saying that and Jacob was left alone and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. So whether that man is actually 
from his vision or whether that man is actually physical form. And of course, that man, if it is physical, then we're uh, talking about the manifestation. Uh, so, in this case, uh, uh, I, I, I would be more inclined towards the uh, uh, vision that Jacob uh, was having. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, I think this particular section of verses is so interesting, all of it. I, I think we should go through it one verse at a time in, because some of it is just very. Really amazing and puzzling to me but so for ver the verse 24 uh, Sam you're not convinced then this is an a, a appearance that it could have been a vision but Bill what's your reaction to that well like, like I said my, my, my opinion is it, it was the real deal you know personally you know whether it was a, a, a vision or, or a fleshly manifestation you know is as 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 you know, Sam said that that's not the, the point of the matter. The point actually is this man was God either manifested in a vision or in, or in you know, reality. You know, I personally inclined to the fact that it was an actual physical manifestation and he had a, he had a wrestling match with God. Uh -huh. but, you know, that's, my, that's my personal take on it. I don't, I don't think I would... Um, um, uh, assume that this was not a reality, that it was a vision, because there's no there's no indication, there's nothing stated that it was a dream or a vision, so I'm going to assume that it was a, a reality. But let's go on to verse 25, because this part gets really interesting to me. It says, And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint. Now, uh, as he wrestled with him, so this man that is wrestling with Jacob, he, he saw that he prevailed not against him. Now, obviously, at the end, Jacob says it was God. But how could God not prevail against Jacob in a wrestling match? <laughs> that's why I said it's more like a vision that's, uh, that's quite representative of a lot of things. Uh, and also, Jacob was quite a dreamer as well. He was... He, he saw a lot of things in his visions as well. And my experience uh, when I had visions, they are quite real. They're more actually real real than real life, so to say. So uh -huh. the point here is that uh, I think uh, the, um, how Jacob was, uh, was so... Uh, He's showing his tenacity in a way, and also his, uh, uh, I don't know, his, his patience, I don't know, his, his patience, uh, and it's like, you know, he's, he's his stubbornness, you know, it's like, you know, when he took away the, uh, <laughs> from when he sold uh, the, what do you call that, the, uh, the, uh, the elder, uh, was born. Uh, was it, what was his brother's name? He bought the uh, the, the the brother uh, with the soup. Esau. The right of elder son. Yes, Esau. Right, and all, so, yeah. all the things that he does, it is it, it's, it's, it's not something that normal people, so to say, would do. <laughs> it's quite sly in a way as well. Yeah. Um, Let me ask you about the this uh, part here that. Not only him wrestling and and uh, God, this man could not prevail against Jacob. But I, I'm a little confused on these 25 and 26 about who's who and and uh, so it says. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, um, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint. So if that verse looks to me like this is the man or God that is uh, not prevailing against Jacob, so he touches Jacob's thigh, hollow of his thigh, and it went out of joint. But in the next point, verse, I'm confused because it says, and he said, let me go, for the day breaketh, and he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. So if that's, if that's um, God put, holding Jacob's thigh, uh, that seems to me that's God asking Jacob to bless him. And then he says, and he said unto him, what is thy name? 
and he said, Jacob. So this verse show says that it's Jacob that is uh, holding the man. And I th I, is anybody else as confused now as I am on those three verses? Who's who? Well, like I said, you've got a wrestling match going on there, so it gets confusing in the heat of this. <laughs> so, well, it, it's, it's confusing. I, yeah, it does make sense you read it three or four times Let me look over at, and over and over. I'm going to look at this and amplify it. Maybe, maybe I'll get a little more. Well, verse 25, when he saw that he could be a lot against him, um, that's, um, that's, the, uh, that's the angel of the Lord. Um, and also, we got to understand what prevail actually means. You know, it's not just, I don't think it just means that um, someone's more powerful and, and things like that, but rather as if it is um, persuaded to do something. So we got to ask why they were wrestling in the first place. And all of a sudden, Je uh, Jacob was left alone, and then they're wrestling. <laughs> you know, so for what? Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe there was some kind of behind behind story that that the man uh, was trying to persuade Jacob to do something. So you know, I don't think the uh, the prevail here is used as uh, more powerful than others, so to say, but rather uh, in a sense of persuading someone to do something. You know. Okay. Let me read this whole section in the uh, amplified because the, it it in, it kind of explains it as it goes. At least in the the whoever wrote the amplified, whatever man or committee wrote it, this is how their take on it. It says, "And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled wrestled with him until daybreak. And when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched the hollow of his thigh." And Jacob's thigh was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you do. Okay, N that makes sense to me now because um, the man put Jacob's thigh out of joint. But when it says, let me go, for the day is breaking, uh, Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you declare a blessing on me. Um, I was confusing the letting go as still holding onto his thigh. But in a wrestling match, even though, let's say, if Bill had me and uh, he put his hand on my thigh and, and my leg came out of joint and uh, uh, he did that to me, but then Bill wanted to go and I still wouldn't let him go, that it has nothing to do with it. It doesn't change the fact that he had hurt, put my thigh out of joint. I still have a hold of him with my arms and won't let him go. So to me, I, it is clarified there. But... Uh, then he said, let me go for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you declare a blessing upon me. The man asked him, what is your name? And in shock of realization, whispering, he said, Jacob, supplanter, schemer, trickster, swindler. <laughs> and he said, your name shall be called no more Jacob, supplanter, but Israel, that's contender with God. Uh, for you have contended and have power with God and with men, and have prevailed. Then J Jacob asked him, Tell me, I pray you, what, in contrast, is your name? And he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And the angel of God declared a blessing, a, a blessing on Jacob there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, that's the face of God, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and my life is spared and not snatched away. Um, well, I think the last part there uh, argues against your position, Sam, about it being maybe a vision, um, because you know, the, and he says, "And my life was spared. I I seen God face to face, and my life was is spared and not snatched away." I think that would indicate it was a physical uh, a confrontation um, uh, uh, with God, because no one has ever questioned that that uh, their life is at risk by having a vision, but but only if they're when God said to Moses, you can't see me, no one can see my face or they'll die. I think like when we talk of, um, and, and, and people saying they've seen God, uh, you know, but face, face, face to face doesn't only mean just physical sense. Uh, it's a direct contact relationship, I think. And 
You know, the more I read this, I think he might have been dreaming. Uh, and and um, and when the sun rose, you know, usually people wake up. <laughs> so he might have been dreaming, and like like when he was uh, dreaming at the the Jacob's letter and, and so forth, and angels going uh, up and down. Uh, I think he was quite a dreamer, but whether that's uh, this is actually physically happen or whether it's in dream or 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 visions. Uh, I think the message is quite clear that you know, despite the fact that uh, he has seen God directly face to face, uh, his life is preserved. So, you know, because he was uh, very persistent, <laughs> because he was uh, he 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 knew, I guess, he, how to take care of himself, or, or to the point that he was so, uh, I don't know, I don't want to use the word selfish, but he was quite selfish in a way <laughs> that, that uh, you know, either this or what, you know, I'm, I'm not going to, he's, he's quite stubborn, unless you bless me, I'm not going to let you go, uh, unless, unless this, uh, you know, even like throughout his life, when he's working for uh, his uncle and and for, for, for his wife and so forth. We can see his um, tenacity, um, his diligence, and unwilling to compromise, and um, that sort of uh, strong character. Uh, I think that's what God actually, uh, you know, respected in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I want uh, Bill to uh, give me his final comments on this, but first I want to say that this, this uh, name Jacob, um, yeah, in the Amplified, it says it means supplanter, schemer, trickster, swindler. Now, yes, yeah, Brother Bill. <laughs> uh, no, bro, not Bill. Bill's not the, like that. It's Jacob we're talking about. But uh, supplanter, of course, uh, could you take those words supplanter, schemer, trickster, and swindler, and, and cite why those words apply to Jacob and the hand brother Bill. Well, well yeah, because he, 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 he uh, got the blessing. You know, he tricked you know, his brother Esau. You know, Esau was the eldest, and, and obviously under Judaic tradition and the like, and generally in family, especially in those times, uh, you know, the, the, the blessing, the wealth, and everything generally went to the first son. Esau was the first son. Obviously, he saw, you know, like hunting, he went out and he come back and he was starving hungry. You know, that, that, that Jacob kind of him. He said, well, look, you know, you, you, you can have, I'll make you some pottage, you know, which is like a stew. So, you know, I, I, want, I, I want the blessing. In other words, he was supplanting his older brother there. Mm -hmm. And, he's, you know, because his brother agreed with it, which, you know, is his own fault. You know, and, and that's the story went on. You know, he went into his, the father and, and he tricked him, didn't he, put put a fluffy arm on, so his dad felt his arm and thought it was Esau because he was the hairy one, and he got the blessing, inheritance and everything. So hence, he's the supplanter, the deceiver, the trickster. You know, and, and yeah. in, mod, in modern, because Jacob is James in modern English, it means the same thing. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. And it says, uh, schemer, uh, with his mother, they schemed together to trick yeah. Isaac, the father. I saw, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and a swindler, swindler, oh uh, yeah, he swindled his brother out of the, the, the inheritance that would have gone to him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, he swindled, because they, even when he uh, married his uh, father-in-law, kind of, they swindled as well, because, uh, you know, the, the daughter took all the uh, her father's idols and gold and stuff like that, so, and, and they couldn't have done a run, run up from his father-in-law as well, didn't they? And... <laughs> Before we move on to Exodus and Moses and the burning bush, I posted the notes there in the comment section. But before we move on to that, uh, Brother Bill, could you talk about verse 30 here in, with Jacob? And verse 30, you say? Yeah, verse 30 that we in the Jacob account, 30, chapter 32, verse 30. All right, did you want me to read for that before or King James? Uh, however you want. I just want your, your take on verse 30. I'll, I'll, I'll read it from the, the King James verse. It says, 
And Jacob called the name of the place Penal, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. You know that's that's you know that's why I believe it was more of a an actual a physical thingy because he saw because everyone knows the scripture said you know if you see God face to face you'll die. So as far as I'm aware, you know, because even Moses wasn't granted that blessing. You know, Moses could see the shadow and the burning in the bush, but even Moses was denied, you know, that that privilege. You know, we're talking Old Testament of seeing God face to face. But yeah. so amazingly, this this bloke, you know, Jacob survived that. So he must have been one tough, one tough cookie that to have a have a fight with God, see God face to face. And he only got, you know, he just got away with his, you know, hip being pulled out of joint. If that was me or you, we would have been burnt alive. And the one thing for sure that is that uh, he knows what's good, and he knows, uh, 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 you know, what to get, and he knows how to get it. <laughs> you know, yeah. persistent. Yeah. Oh, here it is. I love these examples of these heroes of the scripture, and you know, we know that Jacob, he had his name changed to Israel. And Israel is based upon the, the nation of Israel, and the Israelites are based upon uh, this man and his descendants. <clears throat> and uh, and so he's this great hero of scriptures, and yet he's a trickster, a swindler, a schemer, you know. And uh, so everybody, it seems, and David's a murderer, uh, Moses is a murderer, Paul's a murderer, uh, you know, all, all, all these great people that we admire and love in the scriptures, they are seriously flawed people. Yeah, which is good. <laughs> that gives us hope. You? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I want to say something about the vision, because uh, Sam's the first one that ever uh, uh, put this as a poss possible it was a vision rather than a, a, and a real uh, uh, or dream, yeah. reality uh, or a dream. But uh, I, I had visions that were so real, that, I mean, uh, even more real than reality. But my wife told me that I should only eat the mushrooms I get at the store instead of the ones I found in the, in the woods, so after that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it is, it is true that uh, visions are quite real, than, and real and true than reality, you know, that's, that's for sure. Yeah. Because I can remember my visions uh, better than any of my past experiences, so... All right, let's look at, uh, unless there's something else needs to be said about that, let's, let's look at what I posted here on Exodus uh, uh, th 3 and these verses here. that are. That, um, it says, There the angel of the Lord appeared to him, Moses, in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that through the bush was on, uh, saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to, to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. And do not, not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. I think there's more there uh, that as far as uh, God uh, covering Abraham's eyes as he walked by and only let him see his hind parts. Uh, maybe we can pull up more of that. But uh, uh, So that's. Uh, let me get to your, your reaction to that. Yeah, I've got just, it, it, it's still sort of on topic, but not on topic, that makes sense. But what is interesting, I think the King James certainly gets this right, is if, if you look at verse, uh, let's have a look, we're obviously in chapter 3, verse 4, you accidentally said it wrong, but I'll read it anyway, and it says, And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. So he didn't say, here I am, because that's God's title. But in the next verse, it says, God says, I am God. And it's interesting, if you look in the King James Version, it's, it's, when people are talking, it's usually 
you know, here am I. But when God talks, it is, you know, here I am. Just for that little side note. Little yeah. side note. Uh, the uh, the notes that I posted here, uh, I don't know what translation he used. I didn't even check it in it, but uh, let's let's be more careful here. Let's look at um, Exodus uh, three, two, verses two through six. Let's just look at that, and then we'll move to these others. Yeah, that's a good point, brother Bill. Maybe. That's why I like to stick with KJV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would have used KJV initially because I'm a KJV firstist. I I always want to look at it first before I look at anything else. But um, so in KJV, um, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's just basically verses four and six. They make that distinction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, that's very good. So God refers to himself, I am, and, and, and uh, Moses refers to himself, here am I. And it's a, it's a distinction that we know is significant because I am is God's name. Okay. Four through, let's look at chapter four, verses, verse 17. We'll see what that says. Control C. Uh, now she'll take this rod in thine hand. Oh, that's just God speaking to to Moses again. Uh, where is that part that I want? I cited earlier. Where uh, is it in chapter three, where God uh, covers Moses's face? Let me just look at Exodus chapter three. Cool. Okay. Uh, in, in Exodus chapter 3, I'm not... And Moses hit his face. Well, you know, Moses was going to stumble onto, uh, you know, the, the bush. In verse 3, Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush is not burnt? <laughs> in verse 4, and when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, that's when God said, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And verse 5, and he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet. For the place where on thou stand is holy ground. And, uh, uh, right. Do you know where that part verse, is? Where verse the, 6 we're talking about. Verse 6 is talking about. Moreover, he said, I'm the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look up on God. Mm hmm. Um, well, I, I'm wondering where that part is that I cited uh, where God walked by and he said, don't look at me, and he covered a Abraham's face and God had walked by, so he couldn't see his face, he could only see his, I think the word is hinder, hinder parts, but I'm not finding that anywhere, do you? It's oh, light, light, that's a different yeah, light upon... Right. Yeah, yeah. Later on, in in uh, when he's on Mount Sinai, you know, he, he, you know, he's not. He saw the shadow. He wasn't allowed to see God physically, so he could see the shadow of God. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Okay. Um, let's look at this Exodus 24 now. Uh, 24 9 through 11. Here, I'll post it. And this is in KJV. Uh, then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, <laughs> and 70 of the elders of Israel, 
and they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand as they saw God and did eat and drink. So here you have uh, 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 Sam, you got Moses and Aaron and Nadab and, and Abihu. There's a group of them and 70 of the elders. So you have a lot of people. This is like Jesus appearing after the resurrection to all those people as a, as a great proof for the resurrection. Here you have not just uh, Jacob, uh, not just Jacob having um, all by himself, as you said, Sam, but you have a lot of people. So what's your reaction to that? What first was that? From Genesis, what? It, it, it's posted in the comments. It says Exodus 24, 9 through 11. I posted it in a section 9, 10, 11. It says they went right. up right. Yeah, and they saw God in verse 10, and they saw the God of Israel. Mm-hmm. Read verse 10. Right. And they saw God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a, a sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in his uh, cleanness, clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. Also he saw God and did eat and drink. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, a lot of guys saw <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, what's interesting if you read it further on you see you know, so they sort of saw God you know dimly like as for a, you know a glass because it, you know it says you know that and Moses went up the mountain the cloud covered them so as if there was a vapor or a cloud obscure on the whole face of God I think that could that could be an element because we know that God is a consuming fire, don't we? We know that. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting. What verses are you referring to now? I was, I was referring, can you hear me all right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I was referring to uh, verses, I suppose you could start from 15 down, down to the end, which is 18. Uh, let me read that. And Moses went up into the mount, and a cloud covered the mount. And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days, and the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud, and the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and get him up into the mount, and Moses was in the mount forty days and forty nights. So what is your point about that? But basically, that that although these people and Moses could see God, it, it, it would be dimly and vaguely because because of the mist. You know, God created a cloud or a mist around him. And, and I think you know because otherwise, Scripture would contradict. Because you know, you can't see God face to face and live. Old Testament we're talking because we obviously saw him in the New Testament, Christ. So you know, there had to be something to mask God. In, in some way or another, and I believe that the cloud, or a firmament, or you know, or mist, you know, you know masked and, and veiled the, the, the full glory of God. There's a note I have here uh, from some theologian where I, I looked at found his notes. It says, he says, frequently the term glory of the Lord reflects a theophany, as in Exodus 24 16 through 18. Uh, is that what we're looking at now? Let me see. 24. Yeah. So uh, uh, this this writer thinks that these verses are, are a theophany because when it says the glory of the Lord. And there doesn't seem to be any kind of, uh, uh, what is it called when you uh, turn something into a person, the, the way you... Uh, um, Personify. I, I don't see in, in the idea of uh, glory of the Lord as any kind of personification, whereas 
when you have uh, he walked. That's a personification because a person walks, not a, not a not a cloud, you know. Okay, um, now let's go to. Uh, uh, Ashura. Let's go to uh, Deuteronomy 31, uh, verses uh, 14 and 15. And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thy days approach that thou must die, and call Joshua, and present yourselves in the tabernacle of the congregation, that I may give him a charge. And Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tabernacle of the congregation. And the Lord appeared in the tabernacle, in, the, in a pillar of a cloud. And the pillar of the cloud stood over the door of the tabernacle. So it was this, interesting again, you know, when, when God appears, there's a cloud in there, it's given to, to veil his full glory, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I guess it's because he was just wanted to protect them, because uh, God said to Moses, um, he needed to protect him so that he didn't see his full glory, otherwise he would be killed. So he covered his eyes as he walked by, and... And, and he, Moses only saw his back as he walked past. So there's something about looking into the face of God, unless he puts over this pillar of cloud or something that, uh, that protects us. I wonder if we're going to someday in, in, uh, in eternity be able to look at God face to face completely and see, see his, his, his complete glory. I think we, we might be blessed enough to do that. I know that, that even the angels, when it, you, you have the angels where they're, they're, they're the, you know, one set of wings is even, you know, crossing their eyes because God's glory is so magnificent that even the angels have to use one set of wings. That's a seraphim, I think, isn't it? One set of wings to, 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 to hide, you know, his glory and another set to fly and, you know, this interesting stuff. But even these angels, you know, in heaven, you know, cannot see the full glory, but I think we're going to be extra blessed, and that we will, you know, because we'll have new bodies, so we won't be consumed, you know, like fire. Interesting stuff, though. Yeah. Um, wow. Uh, and in Job, uh, chapters 38 to 42, uh, there's uh, uh, sites as an example of God... Uh, that's an awful lot. Chapter thirty-four to thirty-eight to forty-two. Uh, this this writer is citing all these chapters as this uh, theophany. Uh, the the entire, in other words, the entire account of Job uh, and God and Job having their conversation. He cites that as a as a uh, theophany. I don't know how much we should read from that. These. Uh, four or five chapters here. That's an awful lot to cover, but why don't we just ask you just to, you know, get your reaction to this this uh, encounter between Job and God. The part that I always liked about this uh, encounter was when, when uh, uh, God puts, puts Job in his place and, and uh, says, hey, you know, look what I created. Could you create this, this world? I forgot how it's phrased, but uh, he really puts uh, Job in his place.
Hmm. All right. Well, I don't want to go over the, all those chapters of Job right now, but uh, uh, let me see. Uh, how about um, Joshua uh, 5? Verses 13 through 15. Did, did you want me to read them out? Did you? Luke? Go ahead and read that. Joshua 5, verses 13 through 15. Right, can I read it out for you then? So it's 13 to 15. And it says, And it came to pass, when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and beheld, there stood a man over against him, with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him, and said unto him, Art thou for us, or for adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as a captain of the host of the Lord, am I now come. So we're not ain't God, because it's got Lord. It didn't say, Lord, I am. It says, Lord, am I now come? And Joshua found his face you know, to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place where wrong thou standest is holy. And Joshua did it all the time, yeah. So, yeah, it could be or could not be. That's a tricky one, that one. Well, the... the uh Either, either this is the Lord, and Joshua is worshiping the Lord, or this angel is permitting Joshua to worship him. And I, I don't know of any case in the scriptures where an angel would permit uh, worship of, of him. Uh, yeah. So I, I think that this is an example of uh, the Lord. But he says, a captain as captain of the host of the Lord. This is uh, this brings us to the point of uh, what the Jehovah Witnesses in the uh, Seventh Day of Venice use as a uh, understanding this word Michael. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with that. They have uh, they they have a lot of issues, particularly the Jehovah Witnesses. But uh, with this idea of Michael, the uh, they when it says Michael is the archangel. Uh, they don't. They don't see uh, this archangel as being an angel, just like we don't see here the angel of the Lord as being an angel. I think what we've we've seen so far, I think we all agree that when the, these examples, at least many of them, if not all, these are examples of God, and and yet He's called the angel of the Lord. So does that mean God's an angel? I don't think so. So when when we see the term archangel, uh, they would argue that archangel just means you're you're in charge of angels, you're above the angels. They, the angels all follow you; they're under your your leadership. Uh, so that's why they think that the name Michael, uh, not that Jesus is an angel, but the name Michael is a name for Jesus because he is in charge of the angels. But not, he's not an angel, but he's in charge of them. Uh, as as the like the general, so uh, in this case, I would say that this uh, verse that we just looked at here, uh, it would be another example. He says, "Captain of the Lord's host," but as captain of the host of the Lord, captain doesn't mean that he's part of the angels. It just means that he's in charge of the angels. Do you see the distinction? Yeah, so it's a real complicated. Yeah, this is like this is a complicated one. It's not straight and cut like every single one. You know, predominantly like, every single you know verse or scripture we've quoted today is a clear, you know, without controversy, a theophany, a Christophany, or, or even a triophany. But this one, to me, is a bit of an enigma. Well, I think that we we were in, we're in a uh, a pickle here. We either have to say that this is a theophany and that this term, captain of the host of the Lord, uh, is just another title for God. He's in charge of the angels. Uh, we have to accept that. Or we have to say, 
whoa, there is an example of an angel accepting worship because that's what this person is doing. He's not saying don't worship me, right? Yeah, now I'll tell you what's just happened. I've just had one of my epiphical moments. Okay. And, and, and the moment you just said, Captain, that brought me straight to Hebrews 2.10. All right? And that's interesting. It just came straight to mind as you said that. And it says, For it become him, it's talking about Christ, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Just come out, you know, that the Christ is the, the captain, you know, of, of salvation. Yeah, interesting. That just yeah. came to mind just as we were talking. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't see any reason that the term captain of the, the, the host of the Lord, uh, it, it, it doesn't mean, now we know that the host of the Lord, the host, um, the host would mean, I, I think that refers to the angels. So if he's the captain of the angels, or as another term, archangel, that he's the captain or the ark, the one that's in control and tells the angels what to do, it doesn't mean that he's an angel. It means he has control over the angels. They do what he says. So um, I don't really have, and you know, here's another reason for people to hate me, but I'm not so sure that this term, Michael, uh, is not an acceptable a name for, for Jesus as uh, Archangel. Not that Jesus is an angel. Everybody should know that I don't believe Jesus is an angel uh, uh, created being. Uh, how many videos have I made saying that he's not a creature, he's eternal, and yet uh, Archangel uh, Michael, it could mean that he is, uh, it's another name for him that is saying that he is uh, the one that tells all the angels what to do. Sam, still with us? Yes, sir. I'm just listening. You're quite quiet, Sam. I thought you'd be. I thought you'd be. Uh, have some. Uh, uh, correct me on this, or or hey, or what's going on? <laughs> Don't worry about me. I'm just listening. I'll pitch in when. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right, brother Bill. Um, so you think now that you understand that Jesus is the captain of salvation? That he could very also be called the captain of the host of the Lord, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It suddenly dawned me. Like I said, I was a bit confused, and all of a sudden, it just sprung in my head. Hebrews two ten. I, I don't think we have any choice but to accept that because uh, if we if we didn't, we'd have to say that uh, uh, this in this case, this angel, this captain of angels, uh, has accepted worship. And uh, I've always liked to be able to argue that uh, Jesus accepted wor worship. Only God will, can accept worship. No angel or Paul or Peter, they all quickly said, don't worship me, I'm just a man. Angels say the same thing. I'm, I'm, I'm not God, I'm just his messenger. Uh, but uh, uh, Jesus never turned down worship. In this case, this would be an angel not turning down worship. And I, I don't think that's a valid point. Well, yeah, yeah, because often in Scripture, you know, when, when people do fall down, you know, and they're prepared to worship an angel thinking it might be, you know, the Lord, you know, the angel has said, no, no, you know, don't worship me. Yeah. Um, okay, now let's go back then to another point here. Captor of the army of the Lord appears to Joshua, and that's the one we just did. But his commander there... Uh, now look at, let's look at Daniel... Chapter 3, verse 22 through 25. Um, okay, the king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three firm men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, uh, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, O king. Uh, hey, he said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and un unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of 
God, the gods. That's uh, I don't know what translation that is, but let me look at this in. Uh, and this is the KJV. It says, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Um, there's quite a distinction there. It, would, it could be that Nebuchadnezzar would, would say he's like a son of the gods because I don't know if Nebuchadnezzar was a monotheistic or if he believed in many gods. Uh, maybe you guys know more about his uh, theology. But uh, uh, in the KJV it says, uh, in verse 25, it says, and, uh, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the fourth of, of the form is like the Son of God. And, of course, uh, Sam debunked this last time we talked about it, saying that, well, this is Nebuchadnezzar saying that. It's not God saying it, so it's, it's Nebuchadnezzar's opinion. So... Uh, do you think there's any more? Do you, you think that uh, Sam's uh, uh, position on this has much strength, or or should we just say this is clearly uh, a Christophany? Well, I think personally it's a Christophany. You know, but it'd be interesting. You know, if we had the time, I don't think you know we're going to have the time this evening. But to actually look, you know, look into the the Hebrew, you know, at these verses. You know, you might get a little bit more context, perhaps. But you know, the way I see it is because you know, I, I, you know, when the King James renders things, you know, son of God, son of God, you know, with just a small s, it's talking about men, people, and stuff like that. But when it's a capital S, we know that's referring to Christ. So even even the translators of the King James have concluded, I think, the same as what I conclude that that that, that Nebuchadnezzar probably did actually see. You know, Christ in the furnace. That's what I believe personally. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, because the, it, despite that, that's his observation, that maybe his opinion. Um, but it's uh, very much likely that uh, you know that Christ was among them, and also as Brother Bill has mentioned, that uh, capital letter son, uh, the Son of God. Only question that I have here is that he said the fourth is like the Son of God, and in order for anyone to say that, you have to know or have seen that you know what the Son of God would look like, even. Yeah. So I don't know how and what made him at this uh, uh, at this point from the passages. Uh, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say Nebuchadnezzar saw the Son of God, therefore he recognized the Son of God, or any kind of encounter like that. He must have seen the Son of God uh, before. So the fact that you say that the fourth was like the Son of God, then, then, um, then at least Nebuchadnezzar had some sort of encounter with the Son of God before. Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, very. Uh, who knows? Uh, maybe, maybe this is an example of God giving Nebuchadnezzar this revelation and understanding of who it was, uh, or maybe it is like you said a couple of weeks ago that it's just Nebuchadnezzar coming up with this idea somehow for some reason, and who knows why. But regardless. We know that there were three men, and then there's four, and none of them were harmed. And uh, so this was either uh, a theophany or Christophany, or it was an angel that, that released them. Uh, that brings me to a final point I want to bring up. Uh, uh, this is something I learned. Uh, you know, I think we're all familiar with uh, Pastor Stephen Anderson, and he's very controversial. And I believe he's he's one of the most knowledgeable and best uh, Bible teachers, uh, and yet I think he's got some real big problems too that I don't agree with. <clears throat> but uh, um, I, I just finished watching his entire um, teaching on the Book of Revelation. There's 22 videos, 22 lessons, one for each chapter, and it was very interesting. And I, you know, I'm not in complete agreement with him on how he sees end times, but uh, 
uh, he did say one thing that I thought was really interesting that I was not aware of. He 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 was talking about how um, God sent an angel to give this uh, uh, to do something, and he says in this case I, I think this was actually a man. This was someone who was saved uh, uh, that was up in heaven, and God sent them back to the earth to to do something. Uh, and that's the word angel. He doesn't believe it was an angel like we think of a seraphim or cherubim or uh, any other uh, angelic being. Uh, and he said, in this, he used this term angel and used the word evangelist in a way that I've never heard before. Brother Bill, I particularly will probably like this. If we look at the word evangelist, in the middle of it you have the word angel. So, uh, and the beginning, the prefix means good, um, and 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 then ist is one who delivers. So an evangelist is, uh, and me angel means message or messenger. So it, based on that, I would have to declare Bill as as an angel, in that sense, a messenger. And he's uh, giving a good message, so he's uh, an Eve angelist. Someone who's giving a good message, good tidings, the gospel. So do you, did you ever stop to think that in the middle of the word evangelist is the word angel? No, I've, I've, I've learned something today. So it's good. That, so there are actual proof now that you have panda angels. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's, that, that, that's interesting. That really is interesting. I, I didn't think of it, but I suppose logically, you know, delving into the world, you know, world breaking up, yeah. Because we know angel means messenger. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I, I talked to Brother Jack Smack you know, the other night on the phone about this, and uh, he was uh, in agreement with it, and he was familiar with the, the, the words. <laughs> Jack, Jack Smack. Uh, you know, as as uh, unique of a person he, as he is, I think we'll all agree. Everybody who knows him, either some people love him as I do, and other people really hate him for their, their various reasons. But he he is a very smart person and uh, um, very intelligent. I told him I've never seen anybody, I've never encountered anybody in my life, professors, theologians, writers. I've never known anybody who has the vocabulary that Jack has. And uh, he explained to me why he has that vocabulary. I won't go into any more details about that, but but I I did discuss this word with him, and he broke it down and said he was in total agreement with, uh, even though he also has issues with uh, uh, Pastor Anderson, uh, he uh, he thought that he was correct in that case. Sam, or, Sam? Uh, well, you know, I don't I don't know what the I, I do hear that people have some problem with uh, Pastor Anderson, but personally, I don't have any problem with him. Could you could you name one, maybe? Well, he he thinks that homosexuals cannot be saved. They're reprobates, and they cannot be saved. Uh, and he uh, that's that's the main the main thing. And he thinks that a law should be passed in this country, uh, making uh, homosexuality a capital crime that they should be executed. That's the main thing. I mean, there's other things that people don't like, um, and uh, but but uh, for the most part, I, I like his theology. Uh, he also thinks that if you don't read the King James version, if you're reading the NIV, uh, if you're truly saved, you'll see that you can't read the NIV. That at some point, you be, it better dawn on you that you shouldn't read these modern translations. And if you don't realize that, if you don't go to the KJV, it's proof that you're not truly saved because the Holy Spirit would convince you that you must use the KJV. It's that kind of a stuff that is that's a problem. I see. Uh, but, extreme, um, uh, in a way. I, I, don't, I remember him saying that um, he did clarify before. Um, he, he didn't say that homosexuals cannot be saved, um, but rather he, what he said, I think, was that he, they should be uh, apply the law that's been applied before against homosexuals. So in that case, I, I you know I see him as a little extreme, 
but I, I don't I don't recall him saying that homosexuals cannot be saved. So. Yeah, I've heard him say that. I've, I've watched a lot of his videos, and I've heard him say that. But um, that's not the real point. Is you know, uh, he his uh, teaching against Calvinism, against Romanism, uh, teaching salvation and uh, uh, defining repentance correctly. All those things, he does a wonderful job. Uh, it's just that he has some extreme crazy ideas against homosexuals and 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 uh, on KJV onlyism that is not acceptable. Uh, but uh, the, my my point was that in. There's a lot that still can be learned from him, and this idea about evangelist was something I thought that was really interesting, and uh, I'm sure Brother Bill appreciates that being an evangelist. Well, yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, and I, like I said, I have a couple of minor issues. I think one about the homosexuality thing with Anderson, but other than that, you know, and I've still got to be honest, his his salvation message. You know, his brief, his, his, you know, how to get saved message is still the best salvation message that I've ever heard on YouTube. It's so clear and precise that, that, that it's amazing. Yeah. You know, I'd recommend anyone, absolutely anyone, you know, he's spot on when it comes to eternal security, his salvation and gospel messages, you know, he can't be faulted, end of. You know, and, and for them alone, you know, that's why, you know, I'm not taking the stance that many... You know, brothers and sisters, I even know who, who are disassociating themselves from him because he went OT to the homosexual. Yeah. Because his yeah, gospel message is it, fantastic. I've not seen one better. I've even got it on my website. It's that good because you can't watch, it's only literally seven or eight minutes, but you can't honestly watch that and not see how clear and simple salvation is. And, and I think he's, he, he's got that to a perfect art. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, well, let's, I don't want to go off too long. We, you know, if, if, if there's a, enough that we could do an entire hangout discussing discussing him and his, his good points and his bad points, but I'm, I'm sure that uh, anybody could find some fault in me or you or anybody. But, uh, um, yeah, it's not, it's not going to fall in me. <laughs> yeah, let's get back to the uh, the idea of evangelist, um, uh, brother brother Bill. I guess you are an angel uh, because the word angel means messenger. Do you have a good message? Uh, can you deliver a good message as an evangelist? Would you could, would you do that for us now? Well, yeah, I, I can deliver. The good news, yeah, I, I can give you the best news in the whole world if, if you want it. I can do it right now. And please, this is please do for, <laughs> we don't, we don't especially want watching this video to, to just understand, uh, you know, the angel of the Lord, uh, Theophanies, Christophanies, and then walk away uh, as a lost person without salvation. So let's, let's make sure they understand that and then we'll close the show. Yep, yep. So this is, this is the most important message you'll ever hear in your life. You know, it, it, it's all very well, as we were saying, you know, these people had, you know, Theophanies, Christophanies, or even a Triophany. They was only temporal things, you know, but the beauty is, if you're a saved person, if you become a son of God, that would be more than just a Theophany, that would be a permanent presence, you know, with a living God himself, who, who for sure is a captain and lover of every creature's soul out there today. But before I deliver the good news, it's only right that I give... Give you a little bit of bad news, and the bad news is, is the word says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And sin means to miss the mark. You know, God sets His level here, and and, and even on our best, most fantastic day or, or life month, whatever, you know, we'll be lucky to get there. That's the best we can do, and that's falling short. That's missing the mark, and that is what sin is. And unfortunately, the wages of this sin is death, and that's separation from a loving God. You know, you can, you know, we're regardless if it's a eternal hell punishment, regardless if it's annihilation, it doesn't actually matter. The fact of the matter is, you will miss being face to face with God and having a lo loving relationship. But the good news is, despite us all falling short of the glory of God, and despite the wages of sin being death, the good news this day is through Jesus Christ is eternal life. He can offer every single person every creature today eternal life and it is exactly what it is eternal and it is life 
It's a life filled, you know, with the presence of God and the love of God and the mercy and the grace and all that is good in this universe with God. And that is the best news in the world that you can receive at this day. And it ain't hard to receive. You know, you don't have to go through, you know, religious hoops or doing, you know, theological, you know, somersaults to, to, to see God face to face and be a son of God. All you've got to do is simply believe that he loves you that much, that he came to earth 2,000 years ago, and he made pain for your sin. You're falling short. You know, in essence, you know, he died that you may live. And that is the best news in the world. And to receive his life and not die is simply to believe, again, that he did die for your sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day glorious, having defeated sin, death, and hell in one stroke. Now, if you were to believe on those facts in whom they are wrought, which is Jesus Christ, Son of God, this day, you will become a son of the living God, and you will live forever in a place where there's no more tears, in a place where there's no more pain, in a place where there's no more suffering, whether spiritual, physical, or emotional. That is the best news in the world, and it's absolutely free. You can't earn it, and you can't buy it. You know, the word of God declares, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. So it's a free gift, you know, that God is offering to you this day. So if you're watching out there and, and, and you want to know this Christ and you want to receive this free gift, receive Christ unto yourself this day and become a son of the living God. Jesus even says it so simply. He says, Verily, very I say unto you, he that believes on me hath everlasting life. It's that simple. He doesn't say, he that you know keeps all the commands, he who lives a good life, he who strives and he who does this and everything else. No, he just simply says, he that believe on me hath everlasting life. So my challenge is to, to anyone out there today, you know, no one is beyond the pale. You know, there isn't a sin that you've done that can't be forgiven. You know, that no one has gone beyond the pale. While you have breath this day, while you have life, and while the light of Christ is still shining on this world and even on YouTube, you can be saved. So I implore you today, please accept Christ as Saviour. Receive him unto yourself and receive the most fantastic gift of all, which is eternal life in heaven with Christ. I pray that you do that right now. Amen. Amen. Hey, Brother Bill, that was a beautiful message. That, that's why it's called the good news. Uh, I think it should be called the great news or the best news. Yeah, uh, I, I, like, I like the term bestest. <laughs> Can I, I want to ask you a couple of follow-up questions before we close, though, because uh, I told a story, I think yesterday I told the same story about how I was street preaching, I gave the same message you just gave, and some people came up and said, yes, we totally agree, and, and they, they, they were also believers like me, but they asked me a couple of questions that I thought were important, and they asked me, well, let's say, Brother Bill, that someone just heard your message. And they're all happy and they're joyful. I can, I know. Wow, I can get eternal life in heaven simply by trusting Jesus as my Savior and believing He died for my sins and He's my Savior, God. And and they're all happy. Uh, but what happens uh, if that person gets tempted and somehow they they create that they go out and commit some big whopper of a sin? What happens? Well, it, for, for starters, it would be a sin. And we already know that Christ has made payment for all your sins. So that sin has been paid for on a spiritual sense. You know, oftentimes in life we commit a big whopper of a sin and there's consequences this side of glory. You know, and, and, you know, for example, if I, you know, if I'm living in America and I shoot someone and kill someone, that's a whopper of a sin. I've murdered someone. But my consequence more than likely would be I'd get the death penalty if I lived in America. Or if I live in Britain, I'd get life in prison. So that's my life over. So there, there's a, certainly a physical consequence to, to sin, I believe. But as for spiritual, no, it's a done deal. Christ has made payment for all your sins, past, present, and future. All right. Now that's good news, too. So uh, as people get, once they get saved and they live their lives, at some point, if they do something really bad, 
you know, they'll have consequences, but at least one consequence they don't have to worry about is is they'll never lose their salvation, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Now, one one last question here. Let's suppose this person just heard your message and they believe on Jesus and they get saved and and uh, now they have this promise of eternal life in heaven and and let's say that something tragic happens in their life ten years from now and the faith that they once had they lose their faith because because they are angry with God and they no longer believe in God anymore uh, they they had to have faith to get saved. And what happens if they lost their faith at some point in the future? I can't hear you. Can't hear you. I was muted there. Sorry about that. <laughs> I, I, I muted myself. But there, there is a scripture, you know, and, and I love it. It's in, it's in, you know, an epistle to Timothy, two Timothy, chapter two and verse thirteen, and that that deals with that very question you just, you know, you posed to me, and and it says, if we believe not. So this is someone who's lost faith for some reason, you know. They, they, they may have had a loss in the family. They must just be so carnal. They've gone, you know, so away from God that, that you know, that they've even stopped believing. But it says, if we believe not, yet he abide faithful, he cannot deny himself. That is a fantastic verse because that speaks of that the we're being saved by Christ's faithfulness towards us and not our faithfulness towards him. Okay, so that truly is good news. So uh, not only can you receive eternal life by putting your faith in Jesus right now, but uh, you're secure. You can never lose it for any reason. Well, it's not based upon you having a, a you know good conduct for the rest of your life. It's not based upon you being faithful. It's based upon Jesus' faithfulness. He will keep his promise. He cannot deny himself. He promises you life everlasting, and he will not break that promise no matter what. That really is. All right. Uh, let me ask if Brother Sam wants to say anything before we uh, close the show. Well, you know, the uh, as Brother Bill and we all uh, are saying, the um, salvation is not really complicated. Um, a lot of people... I guess, you know, wanted to make you complicated. But uh, we are all different, and that's one of the reasons why that God made it so simple that anyone can actually uh, be saved, and that is through Jesus Christ and only by believing on Christ, and, and we can be saved. A lot of times we you know, tend to overdo ourselves and expect others to do the same. But, you know, in some cases, even that is um, rather, if you look at it from a different perspective, we all fall quite short from the glory of God. And no matter what we do, no matter how much we flagellate, um, if you don't believe in Christ, you know that won't it won't be any good. So I think it's best for us to work out our own, own salvation, you know, because we know where we are, and rather than uh, trying to look for uh, tiny little specks from our brethren, I think it's best for us to walk the faith in Christ and become actually perfect in Christ as, as we work out our own salvation, of course, with fear and trembling. Now, you know, there had been a little bit of uh, contention, I guess, uh, you know, that some people were adding to the gospel, such as, like, repent of your sins to be saved, saved and, and things like that and certainly we know that that's not what Christ said he never said that you know if you don't repent of your sins you will perish he did say however that uh, if we repent change our mind from believing um, man-made religions or man-made laws and any other things other than Jesus Christ 
uh, will, you know, if we do so, then we will surely perish. And therefore, we have to turn away from that sort of things and completely and totally trust and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that if you ever believe in him, he will not perish but have everlasting life. And, and that's simple, and that's simple, as simple as that. Um, I don't know how much I can stress that more. Once we are saved, how we walk our faith in Christ will be all different because um, the way we were brought up and how we grow in Christ, we are all different, just like how our faces are all different. Sometimes we need to be a little patient, I guess, for others. And, um, and most of the times we need to edify rather than actually try to fruit inspect. Uh, so I, can, I, I think we can do this more often as we grow bigger, I guess, in our faith in Christ and to help out our brethren, uh, you know, who are confused in certain matters. Um, so again, in order for anyone to be saved, you simply believe on Christ, not just in a sense of existence, but total trust and confidence in Christ. And after we are saved, after we believe on Christ, Christ, because we believe on Christ, we can do now our uh, Good things, if you want, we can we can repent uh, because the Holy Spirit is constantly convicting us, and a lot of times people do mix up those two. Uh, I think you call that discipleship, uh, uh, but uh, I call it uh, walking the faith in Christ once you are saved. So. There are two, th two different things. One is being saved by simply being believing in Christ. And after you believe in Christ as a baby, you slowly grow in Christ. And that's how we walk the walk. And, um, you know, working out our own salvation, our own salvation with fear and trembling. And um, when we kind of put our measuring stick to certain people saying that, oh, that's not Christ-like, or that's not Christian, or that sort of unrighteous judgment, I think we need to, uh, you know, put behind and actually, in fact, help our brethren. Uh, because we never know what sort of status that person might be in, you know. So as long as we constantly think about how we can edify each other, I think we, uh, our faith will grow and you know, eventually become perfect in Christ. Thank you, and God bless you. All right. Uh, Brother Sam, Brother Bill, thank you for participating with me today. We'll close the live broadcast now. Uh, and bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.